There's an incredible opportunity coming our way this next week. And before we get to the teaching, I want to just take a moment and talk with you, Westside, about that opportunity. We're playing the 111 card this Christmas. You've already heard about the Christmas times at Lenexa, at Speedway, up at Lansing, at the prison. Always love to say hey to those guys up there. And uh, that info is in your bulletin. But here's 111. Come one, serve one bring one. What's that mean? We really don't want you to come to all 11 Christmas services. We love you guys, but not that much. You know, really, we want you to come to one and, and, and secondly, to serve in one. We'll have our elementary kids in the room with us for the services this week. It's definitely a family-friendly service, but we're not pulling preschool kids in here. And those of you that love to have your preschool kids all with you and dressed up and in your lap on Christmas, resist that urge, would you? Because here's the reason. They don't have an hour's worth of attention span. Let's be honest, you don't have an hour's worth of attention span, and that's why we're doing great preschool ministry that day, but we need your help. If you could volunteer, if you could come to one service and serve in one, there's an insert in your bulletin today. We especially need help in that 5.30 service on Christmas Eve. I can't think of a better way to do Christmas Eve than to come with your family and then serve with your family in the preschool area. But here's the biggest opportunity. You have an unchurched friend that will come with you this Christmas to one of the services. Secular surveys show that of the unchurched people in America, the folks who don't go anywhere, one out of three would come to a Christmas service if a friend invited them to go with them. You've got a friend. And here's the good news. We're going to be sharing the gospel clearly in our Christmas Eve services. Would it be cool to bring your friend and for them to have that opportunity to hear that this Christmas? So come one, serve one, bring one. Looking forward to it. Turn to your neighbor before we start our teaching and say you look better than you usually do. Go ahead, tell them. God is in the rescue business. That's the business God is in. In fact, if you asked me to give a personal name to this book other than Holy Bible, my name for this book would be The Rescue. That's what it's about. It's the story of how God created man and woman and kids and put us all here, and then we wandered away from him and from that time on, he's been trying to bring us back, not willing to go against our will, but calling us to come back to him, inviting us back to him, willing to rescue us and then use us to rescue others. Here's the big idea for this series. Would you write it in? It is that God does extraordinary things through ordinary people. I love that idea. Think about it. God does extraordinary things through normal people, through ordinary folks. When people look at the church today, they don't go, whoa, that's the sharpest group of people I ever saw. Or wow, they're the best looking folks in society. Or man, I can't wait to see what their secret is to success. No, here's the deal. It's God taking ordinary people, people like me, people like you, and doing extraordinary things through us. How does that happen? Well, in week one, Pastor Matt talked to us about the idea that you want to love someone extraordinary, that we love him because Jesus first loved us. Us. Last week, Pastor Sean blew us away talking about how do you become someone extraordinary, that you quit believing the lies in your life and you start believing the truth of what God has to say about you. On the Christmas Eve services, we're going to celebrate someone extraordinary. It's literally going to be a birthday party for Jesus. It's going to be a blast. But today, we want to talk about how do you share someone extraordinary. I believe most Christ followers want to talk about Jesus, but we're just plain afraid of it. We've got this concept in our head that is not even close to what Scripture teaches. That's what we're going to talk about today. 
God does extraordinary things through ordinary people. Look at our key verse out of Acts 4.13. It's talking about Peter and John, two very young redneck disciples, ordinary guys. Notice what it says. The courts are where they're standing. They're standing in front of a, of a literal, a local government. When they, that's the courts, saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Ordinary guys, I like them. In the Texas version of the Bible, it says ordinary rednecks. That's a joke, but I'd like to write the Texas version. Ordinary people, not particularly schooled, not particularly sharp, nothing impressive about them except... It's obvious they've been with Jesus, and this Jesus guy has somehow worn off on them. We are in the rescue business. In fact, here's the big idea for today's teaching. God wants to rescue me. Wow, that's good news because I create great messes. God wants to rescue me and then use me to rescue others. He loves me and rescues me. And then he says, join me in the rescue business. Join me in rescuing others by sharing me with others. How do we do that? How do we get past this mental block of we don't know how to share Jesus with others? Look at what Scripture says. In Psalms, it says, rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. That's God's commandment to us. He wants us to be in the rescue business. And then it says God sent out his word and he healed them. He rescued them from the grave. How do you and I join Jesus in the work of rescue. Three simple, life-changing ideas. Would you write these in? First, share how Jesus has changed your life. Share how Jesus has changed your life. We've all been there. God gets brought up in a conversation or there's an open door and we could talk about Jesus and we're going, I don't think I can do this. You know, I don't, well, I don't have all the answers to their questions or I don't know all the verses or I don't know all the theology. You know, where's, where's Pastor Dan when I need him? It's not any better for me, I promise you. You know, I, I don't know. I'm not an expert in any of these things. You're right. Here's the problem. The word witness has been messed up for us by watching court TV for the last 40 years. All the way back to good old Perry Mason. Boy, that's dating me. Some of you are going, Perry who? Look it up. It's on the internet. <laughs> old lawyer guy. All the way through all the court scenes we see today. They're always bringing up an expert witness. You know, we have our expert witness on chemistry today. We have our expert witness, our expert witness, and we think we got to be an expert. We got to know all about God, all about theology, all about the Bible, all about the answers to the questions. No, no. You and I only have to be an expert on one thing. How has Jesus changed your life? And you know what? Here's good news. I'm the expert on that. I am the world's leading expert on how Jesus has changed Dan Sutherland. I can talk about that. Nobody else can talk about that. I am an expert on two things, Texas and Sutherland. That's it. And in the other order. That's it. I don't have to be an expert in all of that. Why? Write this in. Because witnessing is nothing more than telling your faith story. That's all it is. How has Jesus changed your life. Here's the good news. That's really what they want to hear. They don't think you've got all the God answers. They don't think you know the Bible. They don't think you've got your theology figured out. People aren't asking those questions anymore. Maybe 40 years ago. Now it's all experience oriented. They want to know how Jesus has changed your life. I put a passage of scripture in there. You can look it up later. Here's the background. There's this man who Jesus heals on the Sabbath, on the Sabbath. He's been blind since birth. Can you imagine never having seen anything? And then as an adult man, the first thing you see is Jesus, the one who healed you. That'd be pretty cool. 
And the religious leaders of the day hear about it, and they pull the man up, they find the guy that used to be blind, and they say, hey, who healed you? Jesus. Go well, tell us about him. I don't know. His name's Jesus. Well, doesn't he know the law? You can't heal on the Sabbath. I don't know if he knows the law. Well, he isn't registered. He hasn't done this right. Da, 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 da. And they're going at this guy, and they're asking him all these questions, and the guy finally responds, I don't know. There's one thing I know. I once was blind, and now I see. Bada bing, bada boom. That's Italian for no more, no less. We're done here. I don't know all those answers. I once was different, and Jesus has changed me. Nobody can argue with you about what Jesus has done in your life. Share how he's changed your life. Number two, we share, if we want to be used by God in the rescue business, we share how Jesus, this extraordinary person, has healed our hurts. But put it in the personal pronoun. Share how Jesus has healed your hurt. I think we've missed this part of Jesus. We've, we've neglected it. He is the great physician, the scripture calls him. He is the healer. He is the one who goes after the wounds in our lives. Everybody look this way. Every person in this room is wounded. All God's children got wounds. For some of us, it happened in our childhood. For others, in our first marriage. For others, there's a kid that we're trying to raise. It's breaking our hearts. For others, it's an addiction we can't get by. For others, it's just any kind of hurt, fill in the blank. There's no such thing as a human being that's an adult that hasn't been through hurts. We've all been there. We could put a microphone down front and say, tell me your pain and talk for the next 24 hours. But that's the wrong focus. The focus for the Christ follower is never to be on our pain. The focus for the Christ follower is to be on how has God brought you through that pain? How is God healing that pain? How is he using that pain? Why? Write this in your notes. Because God never wastes a hurt or a tear. He never wastes a hurt or a tear. Some of you are going, why did I have to go through that? I don't have a full answer to that, but I have a partial one, and here it is. God's going to use your pain to help you walk others through the same pain. God rescues me in my hurt. Are you watching? He does this deal, mends this heart, so that I can be in the rescue business to others. There's a phenomenal book out there by a Catholic priest. I believe he's now gone on to be with Jesus. His name is Henry Nowen, and the name of the book is The Wounded Healer, an amazing book. Here's what it basically says. You can't be used by God to bring healing to others until you let God heal your wound. You see, we've all been hurt, but we got a choice. I'm going to carry my hurt as my identity all my life, which means I become a martyr, or I'm going to let God heal my hurt so I can be used to help others, which means you become a healer. Which one do you want to be? Martyr? Or healer. We've all got something we can become martyrs over. Nobody's got everything the way they want it. Not even God. He's not happy with this world. We've all got hurts. I choose. Is that my identity? Or is my healer my identity? Look at what the scripture says about this. I love this verse. God comforts us in all our troubles. Why? You ready for why? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from him. He comforts us so we can comfort others. Comfort is something you give away. And as you give it away, there's this comfort flow. God gives it to me, I give it to you, you thank God. God gives it to me, I give it to you, you thank God. I'm kind of liking this cycle. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be a part of that healing business. In that same verse, in a different translation, says it this way. God comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who's going through hard times so we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. 
Does that answer why bad things happen? No. Does it answer what we're supposed to do with the hurt? Yes. It does. Let God do healing in you and then pass it on to others. I am married to an incredible woman who's been through incredible hurt in her life. Nobody should grow up in the kind of circumstances that Mary grew up in. Nobody should be sexually abused by family members, by a family doctor. Nobody. Never an excuse for that. Don't even try to give me one. Not an excuse. And she's had a choice. She can let that hurt become her identity in life, or she can let her healing become her identity in life. And because God has healed her and is healing her and she wins more days than she loses and has been willing to share it with others, 500,000 women a day read her online devotions. Everywhere I go, people say, are you the Dan Sutherland that's married to Mary Sutherland? I go, yep. They go, oh, I got stories about you. I don't even want to know. I don't know what she said. I don't want to know. It's just better this way. It really is. She's now just finished her sixth book, written six books. I haven't even read six books. <laughs> In fact, her book that got released this past Monday is already number 15 among devotional books on Amazon.com. Is that God? It's God. Why is that? Because she did not let her hurt become her identity. She let her healing become her identity. Wow. We've all got hurt. All God's children got hurt. All God's children can be healed. And all God's children can become part of the rescue business with Jesus himself. We have such great champions in this church and in our international work. I've had the privilege of meeting many of our, our, our people we work with and through in South Africa and in Thailand and in India. But we want you to meet a young lady today that is amazing, been through lots of ugly hurt in her life, had a tougher childhood than anybody that I personally know. And yet God is using her as a champion today. Pastor Sean is going to interview Koelua. Would you give him a hand as they come? Hi, Westside. I have the privilege this morning of introducing you to a wonderful young lady. Uh, this is Kolelwa Mazungula. Did I say your name right? No. Oh. Oh, brother, out. come on. What's your name? My name is Kolelwa. What she said. Okay. Yes. Um, Kolelwa grew up in South Africa. Uh, she grew up in, uh, she spent the last seven years in one of the children's homes that Westside supports called the Door of Hope. Um, her story is remarkable, and I have a short time, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. But she grew up not knowing her dad. Uh, she grew up with her mother and her brother. Uh, here's a picture of her um, and her family in uh, the shack that they grew up in, a shack very similar to the one outside of Westside right now. That bed is the bed that the three of them shared. The shack is not much bigger than what the photograph can show right there. She grew up in extreme poverty. Um, her mother, when she was little, she found out her mother was HIV positive. And for the last couple of years of her mom's life, um, when she had full-blown AIDS, this young lady uh, would take care of her mom. She'd wash her, she'd cook, she'd clean, she'd, she'd take care of the family, and then go off to school and come back and continue to do these duties. So she grew up a very tough, um, a tough uh, upbringing. Um, when her mother passed away, um, Kolelwa really struggled with that and uh, just had a really hard time. She was shifted off to some family members who were supposed to look after her, and um, they did not look after her the way that she deserves. And uh, she went through a lot of abuse, uh, verbal, um, uh, all kinds of abuse, some unthinkable things that happened to Kolelwa. Uh, she wanted to give up. And uh, there were three times where, where she actually tried to take her life. Thank God she wasn't successful because she's here today and we get to hear her story. Um, but um, after all of this, uh, she, uh, she left the situation that she was in and, 
and, and found somebody who said they would take care of her, but it happened to be a, a place where they sold drugs, and, and they then gave her the job of running marijuana back and forth, and uh, she was like this close to just going over the edge. Uh, but then a woman stepped in, uh, a woman named Mama Gladys Panda, who runs the Dora Hope, uh, a woman who herself um, was, was abused as a child and grew up in extreme poverty, and then used that hurt now to reach out to another orphan and uh, to pull her into a home. And so she has then, uh, the last seven years, been there, uh, did great, went to a great school, and is now a college student, excuse me. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Cole Elwa is studying human resources right now and is making a huge success of her life. So, hi. Hi. This is Westside. Good morning, Westside. <laughs> um, Cole Elwa, you have every excuse for your life being a mess right now, and yet it isn't. It's a success. What, what's going on? How did this happen? Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Um, I would just say that I made it here because of somebody from somewhere believed in me. Somebody with Jesus believed in me that the three of us together, we can make it through. And it made me where I am today. Awesome. And that somebody is a, a woman, Mama Gladys Panda. Mama Gladys, yes. what, is she, what does this woman mean to you? Wow. She means a lot. She means... Wow, she's just everything that I'm not. And she, she just made me who I am. And with her on my side, knowing that she grew up the way I grew up, it just makes it a lot easier. And knowing that there's somebody who cares for me. And, you know, when I, the first time I heard her story, it was like, wow. I was kind of ashamed of the way I grew up a little bit. Uh, I just didn't want to talk about it. I, and she shared her story. And I was like, wow, there's nothing to be ashamed of. And when I came here, you guys were living in a shack. I was ashamed of the way I grew up. And I, now I can say that dancer that I lived in a shack, even if it's one day or two days, you lived in a shack. I know that Jimmy lived in a shack. I know that Sean lived in a shack. So I have nothing to be ashamed of. And, it's just her courage just made me who I am. I remember um, when you came off the street and moved in the children's home, it was a night where you had a lot of emotion come pouring out, and you were sitting in the arms of Mama Gladys for a couple of hours. Yeah, and that, 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 that night we were just you know, praying as a, you know, as a family, and I just burst into tears. I don't know why. I, I, can, I still can't remember why, but she held me in her arms. And there's just, I think, those are, that's just a few words I can remember from her that night. She said, I know, and I understand. I know and I understand. Mama Gladys knows and understands because she went through the same thing. Yes. And she took her pain and her suffering, and she used it to reach out to you. To me, yes. And now you live in a house, you have one brother, but actually you have many brothers and sisters. Yes, I uh, do. How many live in your house? Now we are 35. There's 35 of us. 35. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. It's a big Christmas party. Um, the hurt and the pain that you have. Do you buy gifts for all 35? <laughs> no, you are, bro. You're going to help her out. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you all hear that? <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> keep, keep going. Okay. It's all good. So um, now you have an opportunity uh, because of your background, the abuse, and everything that you suffered. There are children who have been abandoned, who have been brought into the Dora Hope. There are children who have gone through that kind of abuse. Now, you have the opportunity to share with them, right? I just, it makes me feel, I don't know, good at the fact that I can be a role model to those children. And just using the way I grew up to just make them see that there's more than this. There's more to life. And even though maybe... Your friend at school doesn't have have what you don't have. It's okay. It's awesome. You can still make it. <laughs> That's my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> These Texas people, I tell you. 
<laughs> Cole Elwa, we're talking today about sharing someone extraordinary, and that someone is Jesus. Um, tell us what Jesus means to you. Oh, Jesus. Uh, he's everything that I am. He was there for me when I thought I didn't need him. He was there when I didn't even know he was there. And he was there when I, I needed him. And he's just everything. Without him, I wouldn't be here today, sitting next to Sean in America. And he's just everything that I could ask for. Friend, a father, a mother at the same time. You know, just somebody I can trust, somebody to talk to. That's yeah. awesome. So you live in the country on Tuesday, uh, going back to South Africa. Uh, what is one thing that you would like to say to Westside Family Church uh, before you leave? Uh, firstly, I'd like to say a big thank you to you guys. Just thank you for... Uh, thank you guys for everything that you have done for me and some of you gave up some things just for me to get an education and that is something that nobody can take away from me. I know that they, they have taken some of the things away from me but that's one thing they they will never take away from yourself. This young lady is a very courageous young woman, and um, she really has been through a lot. Um, and so these tears are coming from a very deep place. And uh, this is very hard for her, but um, one thing that I know that Kolelwa would want to say to you today, and maybe she can't use her words right now, is that you must never give up. She told me when we were driving, what message do you have for this church? And her message was, tell them never to give up because she tried to give up and she's now glad that she wasn't, that she made it through. And so if you're in a situation right now where, um, where you feel like you want to give up, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Never. Even if maybe, I, 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 I don't know what you're going through and you might say, she doesn't understand. She's just an African devil girl. And I, I, don't, I don't know what you're going through, but look at me. I made it without Jesus. And you are here sitting here right now listening to my voice. You are in the right place. And I know you are in the right place to make it with Jesus in your boat. I think you can absolutely made it, make it. And... Um, when uh, Sean and the team come over to South Africa, uh, they always ask us to sing uh, this one song. And Mama Gladys sang that song over my life, and it made sense at, after a long time. And the moment Mama Gladys said, lead the song, I was like, I don't know. I don't sing. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. But that's when I knew that there is something in me. And she saw that something in me that I didn't even, I didn't even see in myself. So if you would let me guys sing just two words of that song, just two lines, and I'll, I'll first sing it in my language, and then I can sing it in English. Um, Ibo bambelela, bambelela, Oh, Bambelela, Ibo Bambelela, Ibo Bamba Bamba, Oh, Bamba Bamba Bamba, Bamba Bamba, Bambelela, you must never give up. It's beautiful. Yes. Thank you, my sister.
Thank you, Wissan. Thank you. Thank you. About one more hand for this lady. Would you do that? Pray for her. She's going to do that again at 11 tonight at 5. And, and uh, wow, what a story. Those of you that have supported Impact faithfully over the last years, those are the dollars that went to build the orphanage and support the work that Mama Gladys does. And if that's the only life we ever reach, well worth it. But it's not. There are hundreds and thousands of kids like Koelua that God is using you to reach. I bless you, Westside. Third idea today, write it in your notes if you can still see the paper. We share how Jesus changes our lives. We share how Jesus has absolutely healed our hurt. But the third idea is you want to share how Jesus has captured your heart. Now, this is an important part of sharing. People want to hear your story. That's why you talk about how you've changed. People are drawn to the vulnerability of sharing your hurt because then they realize that you're just like them. They're hurt too. But they particularly want to hear about your passion. Share how Jesus has captured your heart. Now, here's what I mean by that. Write it in your notes. When you love someone, you learn to love who they love. When you love someone, you learn to love who they love. For example, in-laws. I mean, guys, seriously, you've got in-laws you would not have chosen. No names, just thoughts. But because they are your spouse's parents or your spouse's siblings or your spouse's kids from a former marriage, you love them and you learn to love them. And it's not fake. It's real. You take them in. You love who they love. If someone is important to my wife, they become important in my world. And my wife has taught me this, even, even just explained to me by her life what the Scripture's talking about on this. When we got married 35 years ago, I took her to a high school football game at which she said to me, which team has the ball? You're kidding, right? Yeah, and what are they trying to do with it? Are you serious? What planet are you from? I mean, she grew up in a house without a TV for years. She, she was not exposed to it. Today, she is the most rabid Dallas Cowboy fan you have ever met. And after last night, that's a little easier. She's into it. She has grabbed it. She's passionate about it. Why? Because I and passionate about it. And sharing life with somebody means you share their passion. You love who they love. We claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. The world wants to know if we have allowed him to capture our hearts. Do we love who he loves? Now, who does he love? There's a passage in Matthew 25, one of many I could have used today. But in this passage, Jesus is thanking his followers. And he says, thank you for visiting me in the hospital. Thank you for taking care of me while I was sick. Thank you for checking on me when I was in jail. Thank you for feeding me when I was hungry, giving me a drink when I was thirsty. Thank you for clothing me when I was naked. And his disciples are scratching their heads going, really so they looked at Jesus and they said Jesus when did we feed you when did we give you a drink when did we give you clothing when did we visit you or care for you when did this happen we don't remember and Jesus said whenever you did this for one of the least of these you did it for me wow we got to grab this idea right in your notes. It's life-changing. Jesus has a heart for the least, the last, and the lost. Why in the world are we investing our lives, our money, our effort, and our energy in South Africa, India, and Thailand? And why in the world would we go after trying to take care of homeless kids? We could just build bigger buildings here. We could just spend it on ourselves. We could just do what we want to do. 
Why would we do that? Because the one we follow has a heart for the least and the last and the lost. And if we don't have that same heartbeat, we are not his. We are not his. I am blessed by Westside being a church that cares about kids. Because Jesus cares about kids. I am pumped that we're going after the spiritual and the physical orphan because Jesus goes after the spiritual and the physical orphan. And the fact that we're doing that not just overseas, but right here in Kansas City, wow. I think God is going, way to go, church. You're getting it. You're getting it. Come on. Come on. He rescues us and invites us to join him in the rescue business. That's the last line. Write it in your notes. Jesus is inviting you and me to join him in the rescue business. He heals us to heal others. He comforts us to comfort others. He blesses us to bless others. For the last 100 days, we've been doing this amazing experience called 100 Days at the Shack. And really, it's been all about the moment that's about to occur. It hasn't been just, hey, give up shoes or give up dinner or or give up the telephone or give up whatever. It's been about what can we do to focus on those that we're trying to reach, that we want to care for. And it's been an amazing, amazing time. Here's what's going to happen in the next few minutes. I'm going to pray in just a minute, and then during that prayer, we're going to give our pledges for 2012 for impact, for what we do beyond ourselves. And we have two goals. If you've been here the last two weeks, you've heard them. Let me say them again. First goal, everybody in. We are not saying to those that are already carrying the load, do more. No, bless you. You are champions. Keep doing what you're doing. We're saying to everybody else, it's time to get in. You should have gotten that brochure when you came in the door. There's a card in the back of it. Many of you came with this card ready today. If you didn't, grab it. Tear it out. Be ready. It says, by God's grace, here's what I plan to give in 2012. We're not asking you to give it today. We're asking you to put this card in. Our first goal is everybody makes a commitment. Our second goal is a million dollars. You know what? If everybody's in, it'll be a million. We pledged about 640,000 in 2011. We've already given 700,000. I'm blessed by that. God has more for us to do. So while we're giving those pledges, we're going to show you a couple of fun, fun things about the shack. One, the local Fox affiliate did a brilliant news piece on us. We couldn't have asked for better publicity than they did. If we'd have written it, it would not have been this good. Fox got it right. Love it when the secular media gets something right, don't you? Can't remember the last time, but I love it when it happens. And I'm blessed by it. I want to show it to you today. I want you to see it. And then secondly, the pastors went out and filmed a little thing around the shack today because last night was the official last night. I got to stay last night, had a blast. I still smell like the campfire. If you want to smell campfire, come up. I'll be glad to hug you and put it on you. But it was just an amazing, amazing time. That's what we're going to experience together right now as we give. Would you pray with me? Jesus. I thank you for a church that wants to get beyond itself. And I thank you, Jesus, for this moment when we can put that desire into action. We pledge now not to a church, but to you, that we're going to love the least and the last and the lost, and we're going to give to do it. Bless this time, Lord. In Christ we pray. Amen. Well, they say extreme situations call for extreme measures, and one group of pastors from a church in Lenexa is taking that cliche very seriously. Fox Force Kerry Wickersham reports how they're doing it all to make a global impact on poverty. It's pretty odd. It's all cool. As the sun rises over Westside Family Church, you wouldn't expect to see one of the pastors warming his bare feet by the fire just outside the front doors. Good morning. How's everybody doing? 
But it's no shock to people who attend here. Sean Collin vowed to shed his shoes on December 9th, and he isn't putting them back on again until the 18th of December. He's doing it to raise awareness of the 40% of people around the globe who can't afford shoes. Percent of people give up something you want so that we can help take care of some real needs around the world. And that's not all Pastor Collin and his colleagues are giving up. Nine pastors here have also decided that they will take turns sleeping in this shack. Day. It's day 24 of 100. This shanty represents billions like it around the world. Cardboard walls, dirt floor, sheet metal roof, no bathroom, and no electricity. We don't need these gigantic homes that we have, that there are families of four that live in a shack this size. And Westside Family Church feeds and educates children in Africa and Thailand and India. And it's not only the pastors that are sacrificing. Would you stand quietly to your feet? It's the whole church. This wall in the entryway is a billboard of personal sacrifice. 100 days of no coffee, no candy, no video games, no pillows. A four-year-old pledges to give up his chocolate milk. Teenagers who won't text or Facebook. Commitments to sleep on the floor, stop eating out, and even... I am wearing the same shirt for 100 days, so and just for the record, I do wash it occasionally. At the end of the 100 days, the hope is that all this sacrificing will pay off in the form of $1 million in pledges. They want to rock their world. <laughs> save more homeless teens, rescue more child prostitutes, feed and educate more orphans. And they say if everyone gives a little, it adds up to a lot. Carrie Wickersham, Fox 4 News, working for you in Lenexa. Many, many people gave up many, many things at the shack. Some people went without shoes and went without Facebook. Part of my journey in the shack is living in such low tech has actually put me in contact with some of the folks that I relate to on the online campus, which has been really, really cool. Sleeping with some of these guys though, I mean, some of them have CPAPs, it's like sleeping with Darth Vader. Um, other guys, they snore so bad, it sounds like a grizzly bear waterboarding a duck. It's really, really bad. But I did learn how to roast bread over a fire and how to enjoy God in the morning, listening to the Bible on my cell phone as the sun comes up and praying with folks and relating to people outside of just a screen. I love about the shack is the community aspect that's come out of it. Even the little children can help lead. Well, I loved uh, just being able to spend time with people that would come by and also the people that stayed with me uh, overnight. But I'll tell you one thing I won't miss are the uh, hard beds. And it's actually harder to sleep on one of these in a night than it is to run 26 miles, I know from experience. <laughs> one of the sweetest things I was able to do is to spend the night here with my seven-year-old boy and to have him sleep beside me in the shack well, he slept, I guess, um, and I listened to him snore all night. I spent a lot of nights out in the shack, but one of the most memorable moments was on a Sunday, greeting people as they come and go. A young family stopped me and asked me, what's the shack all about? And I was telling the story that we're here to raise awareness for victims of poverty and injustice all around the world. And there's a young woman standing beside me who overheard all this, and after the young family left, I noticed she was tearing up, and I said, are you okay? And she just said, uh, I just want to say thank you. I said, well, you're welcome, but for what? She said, well, I was poor, I was homeless, I was in prison, and uh, I just want to say thank you. I've learned so much about being in the shack and uh, about learning that if I will just live simply, that maybe others can simply live. To see God move in a few young men's lives, uh, making critical, life-changing, and life-defining decisions here at the shack, it's been awesome. I came here thinking of myself and thinking of how the, the sleep that I, how much sleep I needed. Didn't actually get that opportunity, but they had the opportunity to invest in the lives of other people and how that I came away blessed. 
every night with those opportunities to meet other people. Well, this is real. People live like this. And it's, in, it's my responsibility to, to learn how to become more generous. One of my favorite uh, memories of being at the shack is staying up late till 11 o'clock and the parking lots all turn out and all of a sudden the stars appear and just looking up and I realize how small I am compared to God and how great of a God he is. The fact that um, there are people all over the world who live in shacks like these um, because where we are from there are thousands and thousands of them and they're everywhere and we we don't see them and um, we don't see them because there's very little that we can do about it and just wish I'm from that people would um, would want to see and, and want to do something about it and so I, I think it's great that Wayside is doing this and that People here are becoming more and more aware of the fact that there are real people who live in these houses. Shacks meant a lot of different things to me. My wife grew up in a shack. It's a reminder of what she's come from. I've never had to live in anything like this. It's been a reminder of how blessed I am. Uh, the shack right here, um, it reminds me of where I grew up as a child. and. It just really, when I, when, when I first came to the States and I heard that the guy is living in a shack, I was like, a shack in the States? What? Are you serious? But for real, when we walked out that door and we saw a shack, I was like, wow, there are people who kind of want to experience what I felt as a child. And I just really think that this shack means a lot to me and great job, guys. I wish you could have seen all of us squeezed into that shack. There's a reason I came out first. Wow. Thank you, church, for what you're doing, what you're going to do. If you weren't ready to put that pledge in today, we'll receive these over the next few weeks as well. Two other opportunities, one new one, one reminder. Here's the new one. Back in September, we moved here at Lenexa, our middle school programming, from Sunday night to Sunday morning, and it doubled in size in four months. It's been an amazing thing. Yeah, go God. So, we're about to do the same thing with our high school ministry. On beginning on January 8th, they will no longer meet Sunday night. They will be meeting Sunday morning. We want to champion that. I want you to hear that I am thrilled about that and looking forward to us making them a priority on Sunday morning as well. So all you parents in that area, I know you'll look forward to that. Lastly, the reminder, you have an opportunity to bring a friend to a great Christmas party in one of the services this week where they will hear about Jesus. That's a win, win, win. See you this week. God bless you, Westside.